Hello and welcome to Coach's Corner with me, Zara Buck. Today I'm joined by two special guests. I've got Sarah Green of England Netball, performance coach developer, and the Vitality Roses head coach, Jess Felby. A warm welcome to you both. How are you doing? Good, thank you. Good, great to see you. So this is just a chance really to get a real insight into coaching from an England Netball perspective, find out all about your careers and experiences. So Jess, let's uh, let's kick off with you if we can. Obviously, you've got a wealth of experience in coaching. Um, can you tell us what led you into coaching? How did it, you know, how did it begin? Yeah, well, I guess first and foremost, I didn't I, I didn't really as a teenager think that this was my career of choice. Um, I definitely had aspirations to be a vet, <laughs> um, wow. first and foremost, which is uh, interesting when I go on to say what really draws me into coaching are the people, um, which is interesting when uh, I set out wanting to work with animals. But yeah, I think um, it's not something that you know, I, I thought was where I would necessarily end up until which point I was obviously a performer and was on the receiving end of some great coaching experiences. And I realised quite quickly that I was quite immersed in the process of how I was being coached. Um, and I guess that's, I mean, the evidence of that is jumping on a train after a session and just wanting to write down everything that had kind of been done unto me um, in order to try and work out the, the why. And I think we all know that children ask that question most days. I know I've got two that are constantly asking me why, but mine seemed to go on a lot longer into, the, into my teens. Um, and as a player, I was certainly on the kind of... Uh, next to my coach is asking why we were doing what we were doing. I was quite fascinated and curious as to the, the process that they were putting us through. And I, I don't think that's the norm or certainly wasn't my experience of, of all athletes at the time. I think sometimes you can walk into a session, get coached and leave and not really be fully engaged. But I definitely enjoyed that process. Um, but I think back to some other kind of experiences that I had and that kind of immersive feel in that in that process, but also quite a nurturing. I, I feel like I'm quite a nurturer. I love to, I care about people. Um, and even some of my other jobs, like radiography was my degree of choice. I've worked in a hospital, I've worked in nursing homes. And um, I think there's certainly something there that really aligns with my coaching style and behaviours now, which is around caring about the person and just genuinely love helping people to, to be the best they can be. And I know that sounds a bit cliche, but it is genuinely what I enjoy most about coaching. So, yeah, I've certainly you know I've sat on sidelines I've watched my mum coach a, a mum's team when I was you know very very young and I think from a from that point onwards without even realizing it I was just curious and fascinated by the whole process really of coaching and caring about people. I love that was there a particular you know turning point I know obviously you said you know you've you watched your mum and you've, you've come from a you know a nurturing background but was there a moment where you were like right okay you know coaching is is for me? I don't, I think that's really hard. I think the quick answer is I don't think there was a moment because my kind of journey into coaching was most probably over quite a long period of time. It, it wasn't like a defining moment as such. I, I kind of got exposed to coaching as most people maybe do, which is taking on quite short term transactional bits of coaching here and there from quite a young age. Um, so maybe from 18 or 19, I, you know, I was taking odd sessions or leading young teams into kind of national championships and things like that. So it was quite a gradual process for me. Um, in retrospect now, I love that because it most probably helped me to work out how to kind of impart my knowledge. Mm -hmm. And I made a lot of mistakes when I first started coaching because I just told everybody everything that I thought I knew, um, which really isn't coaching at all. Um, so I think, yeah, in some ways it was definitely quite gradual gradual but um it's less about I guess the I think it can be you can be fooled into thinking that the title of a job or the prestige around it so I could pick out things like um you know coaching an England under 21 side or being an assistant with an England under 19 side they all sound really important but actually I I think most probably some some of my most tangible and, and important moments in coaching are not around that performance environment. Sometimes they're just an interaction one-on-one -on -one with a player and you feel you really get somewhere with them or connect. Um, and so, yeah, I, I don't think it's about the titles. I just think it's about the immersion in that environment in that moment in time and seeing somebody progress as a result of something you've done and, and sure. feeling that impact. Um, so, yeah, quite a gradual process for me, really. Sure. And Sarah... As performance coach developer at England Netball, can you tell us what that job actually entails? What do you, what do you get up to? 
um, yeah, I guess it's it's basically, I guess the best way to think about it is Jess's job is there to make the athletes be the best that they can be and prepare them to kind of perform when that when that matters. Um, and my job is to make sure that we do that for the coaches. So um, I kind of support all of the coaches that we have in our Roses pathway. So in Roses Academy, all the way up to trying to um, support Jess in that environment. And then also we have like other groups of coaches that we work with. So in the franchises, the Super League head coaches, and then some discrete kind of programs. So the coach development program that we ran um, last year. So just groups of kind of potential coaches. Um, and I guess my aim with that is to kind of expose them to things beyond netball, which might seem a bit bizarre, but it's about the art of coaching or the skill of coaching and coaching as a practice. So thinking more around um, why we do what we do and how we do it, not just the tactical and technical components of the sport, really. Sounds, yeah, sounds multifaceted, really, really you know, fascinating job. And, um, you know, we love the good work that you do. And also a massive congratulations um, for winning the UK Coaching Coach Developer of 2020 last year. What did that mean to you? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, as well as it being like a massive surprise, which was um, which was shocking. So it was like, and it was it was great that it kind of um, got I got surprised with that on one of the camps. So Jess actually like tricked me into pretending to do an interview and then handed it to me. <laughs> um, yeah, it was really it was really special. And um, like I mentioned in some of the other like videos about it, it was important to me because England netball took. Um, you know, like showed a lot of trust in me to come into this role as as essentially someone outside of the sport and to run with a programme that um, that I thought was the right thing to do. And they trusted me and believed in me in, in doing that and, and offering like a broad spectrum of support for, for that project. Um, so it meant, it meant a lot because it kind of showed that, you know, that that had really paid off. Um, and also, I guess for it to be a UK coaching award, you know, the people that kind of like look after great coaching, it yeah, it meant a huge amount to me. So it was a really nice way to end a difficult year last year. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, no, and really prestigious as well. Uh, Jess, obviously development is is a big part of you know what you do and what Sarah is doing as well. Um, what do you do to enable and ensure that you continue to develop as head coach? Yeah, well I, well, I do a multitude of things, most probably not in a very structured way. Um, but yeah, I, I'm a, a massive fan of continuous learning, like it, it, irrelevant of the role that I find myself in now. I, I have a duty to make sure that I'm the best I can be. So seeking out where and how I can get better is really important and a combination of both informal and formal learning opportunities so you know as simple as um, listening to podcasts doing a lot of reading um, a lot of reflection working with like mentors of mine who I know will challenge and think differently to me which I actually really embrace like like I, I have no problem with somebody really kind of challenging my way of thinking. I think that's um, really helpful. Uh, I write things down a lot. Um, so as much as people sometimes um, criticise my lack of technical ability with uh, <laughs> with things, I actually my my first choice would always be to write things down. So I've got notebooks. Um, I, I find it really important. It's it's much more creative and I'm quite a creative thinker in that way. So I find it quite freeing to do that. Um, I invite lots of feedback. So I'll set up um, whether it's sessions with the staff that I work with or with the players or the leadership groups. Like I really enjoy creating those communities whereby I'm gonna hear and listen to some of what has been noticed and the impact that I may or may not have had, whether that's good or bad, it doesn't really matter. It's just learning. Um, and a lot of kind of like vicarious learning opportunities. So kind of just seeing and hearing. So whether that's going much more outside the sport. So Sarah's spoken about the success that she's had coming into a role that she plays from a different sport, but even going beyond that and actually looking outside of sport itself um, for those opportunities. And, and it is really important to kind of really hear and go and immerse yourself in different environments. And, you know, even just being afforded the chance to watch the Super League matches in my role is huge 
huge. Yes, people see it as a function of mine because I I need to watch your players because I'm going to pick a team. But mm. I'm not. I get far more from it than just that. I'm watching the behaviours of the players, the behaviours of the, the coaches on the bench, the interactions, and that is learning for me. So um, yeah, I'm I'm a big fan of it, and we all need to do it. We have a duty to do it if we're if we're expected to produce world class players, which I am. That can be a world class winning team. Then yeah, it's something that has to be part of my daily routine. Mm, definitely how many notebooks are we talking <laughs> we're, t- we're talking a lot of notebooks I, I put it this way my husband complains about it anytime so if he ever gets interviewed we've got a cellar full of uh yeah big big storage boxes full of notebooks from my very first um session actually when I really when I stopped well and when I started at team bath as a player um it was obviously quite a unique environment at the time because it was a daily training program and I used to get the train there and back early in the morning for a 7 a.m session and then again later in the afternoon and it was a most probably an hour and a half two hour round trip twice a day so I used to sit on the train and just write down everything that had happened and there's a lot of questions in my notebooks put it that way more questions than answers. Oh, that's great to hear um, and I guess going back to when you're on the train writing your notes um, you know in your, the early days um, if you could go back what advice would you give to um, you know young Jess and young Sarah um, starting out on your coaching journeys? Um, to Jess first um, well I think mine I've said a couple of times but is don't wait to feel ready um, I think we can kind of sense that there's these prerequisites or competencies which if we meet them then it equates to us being a really good player or a really good coach and um, we won't necessarily stretch ourselves unless we feel ready um, So for me, it's about be okay with not feeling ready, because I think if you're in that space, then you're always going to seek those learning opportunities, which you just asked of me. What do I do to get better? Um, And just be brave, like be brave Mm -hmm. in that space. You might surprise yourself with thinking that maybe I'm not ready or I don't hit these criteria for this particular role or I haven't yet gathered all of that experience. We'll just go and find it um, and be okay with not being ready. I think it's a really healthy place to be. Yeah, it's just starting sometimes, isn't it? I think that's for anything. And Sarah, for you? Um, I guess, uh, like, for me, it's just about being yourself. Um, I had a lot of experiences when I was going through my coaching journey where, you know, I probably was encouraged to um, maybe step outside of my comfort zone, which, which is important, but also to kind of potentially be something that I wasn't. So I was told, you know, I had to be louder, I had to be more aggressive. And, you know, maybe that's just generally like football um, and it being male dominated. But, you know, they told me that I essentially had to develop skills that didn't feel natural to me. Um, and in those moments, I was like, well, I'm never going to be able to do this. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be able to kind of be that person. And it wasn't until kind of um, I was much, you know, much older and had had different coaching experiences that I was like, you know what, the only way that I'm going to be able to do this and be able to be actually the a coach that I feel comfortable being is if I'm just going to be myself um, and, you know, having a coaching personality that fits your personality is important otherwise you aren't being genuine and as I'm sure Jess would you know agree the players will just see straight through that you know you can't be a Jekyll and Hyde type person as much as you might kind of you know be a little bit more um, strict on court or you might have to get things done you can't be two completely different people you you have there has to be elements of like who you are shining through on court as well so yeah for me I, I would just say like just be yourself that's so important Mm. that's really good advice and what's the most rewarding uh, bit of your job Sarah um I guess just kind of like the 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 women that I work with I think often they're coming in you know and Jess and I spoke to a group of women last week you know on a call in the northeast and they asked us some absolutely brilliant questions about um you know how we felt about our coaching imposter syndrome and all of that kind of stuff and I'm just like wow like these questions are amazing and then the, the interactions that we had with them after and to see the growth of the coaches that I've had working with me for the past year, their confidence, their their ability to ask me questions and to step forward and apply for roles now just because they're like, yeah, I think I can do this. And if I don't, then I'll learn something from it. That's mm-hmm. 
that's what's important to me is that people start to believe that um, they can and they become like students of the game really like good learners and just encouraging people to continue rather than just just settle or, or, or just you know stand still yeah yeah and Jess what's the most rewarding thing about being head coach yeah well it's, it's most probably not dissimilar to Sarah's answer in some ways um I think when you first start coaching you, you most probably really love it when players are like sponges and they're taking on board a lot of information but in the environment I'm privileged enough to work in now it's really important for me when I see those moments where they start taking a bit of autonomy and accountability around their own learning and when they're fully immersed and engaged in that process and you can almost step back and you just become an observer of that like in those moments then I really feel like we're on track for creating the type of player that I'm expected to do, which is somebody that in those biggest moments can make the best decisions um, with the best outcome. So I think impacting in an environment like that over time, where players are leading their own learning and that of those around them, it is really important to me. It might look like I'm not doing anything, but actually it's a long time. It can take a long time to get to that space. So it's really rewarding when you start to see that in a group. Great stuff. Oh, that's, it's been brilliant to speak to you both and get, you know, your experiences to date and um, good luck as well in the future going forward. We've got some exciting um, netball to come. So uh, thank you so much. And also just to say to England netball members, there's plenty more content like this on the virtual netball club. So thank you both. Thank you. Thank you.